Our next writer loves dogs with a disproportionate height to length ratio. Most exemplified in his love for his corgi, Diesel Jr. Please welcome Eddie Wong. Hi. Tonight, I'll be reading a segment from my story, Thunder, Blood, and Poppies. The cold, wet mud stopped affecting him weeks ago. His feet were numb. There was no feeling anymore. Twelve days, twelve days had been raining. At first, the rain had been light and would come and go. As the days passed, though, the rain had grown stronger. It hadn't stopped since. The fields of Flanders, chewed up by artillery and drained with rain and blood, were now a soupy cesspit of mud and shell craters. Strewn across the mud and shell craters were fathers and brothers, sons and uncles, boys who would never return home to their families. Some of the bodies had been there for months in a late stage of decomposition. Some of the bodies were fresh, yet to spend a night in the cold, the heart having stopped beating only hours ago. None of this mattered to the corporal, though. Rather them than me, he would think. All dark thoughts, but war had done that to the soldiers, jaded them. Nowadays, the soldiers just grasped for any reminder of home. Enter the corporal and his skill, making tea. When hot water could be found, and in recent days this had become quite rare, the corporal would dig into a special box of herbs they'd brought from home and make tea for all the men in his trench. The payment was usually something small, a cigarette or a square of chocolate, one of the few luxuries the soldiers had. And what started as a means of keeping the men's spirits up, the corporal hung a bag of tea from the side of his helmet. I love the rain, lads, he'd say. It's delicious. This joke was usually accompanied by the corporal sticking his tongue out, pretending he was lapping up tea, followed by several eye rolls and amused snickers. On this particular day, the corporal ran from end to end of the trench, trying to get hot water. It was a special occasion. As he darted about, the rain began to let up. All the more reason to make the tea now. Artillery began to fire. Everything was running on schedule. The attack was planned for 3 p.m. The corporal liked making tea as a parting gift. He'd seen men come and go, drank tea with them one day, and crawled over the corpse the next. Making tea was his way of saying goodbye. It allowed him to move on, even when his best friends were killed. Tommy, Willie, Carter, gone. He found water on the eastern end of the trench. A couple of the lads from the first Australian tunneling company were about to make coffee when the corporal stumbled upon them. It cost the corporal ten cigarettes and three squares of chocolate, but he eventually got the kettle. He ran back to the little crevice in the trench that he and three other soldiers called home. Inside, he retrieved his box of herbs from under the collection of muddy blankets that he slept on. He grabbed the kettle and began to prepare the hot water. One of the older soldiers noticed him get the box. Hi lads, looks like the corporal here is making tea again. A small crowd of soldiers began to form around the corporal's hole in the wall. The corporal figured that most of the men liked seeing him make the tea as much as they enjoyed drinking it. He looked around. A good 20 or so soldiers now stood huddled around him. Guess it's time to start the show then, he thought. Gather round, gather round, lads. Ready to see the magician do his work. I've no doubt this will be the best drink you've ever had. Oh, I, I make them better than what the queen herself drinks. A deep voice rang out. It's true, lads. Corporal can't fight worth a damn, so somebody has to make the tea for us. <laughs> Snickers ran throughout the crowd. It was that damned man Brixton again. He loved to prod the corporal. You're funny, mate, replied the corporal with a smirk. I'm sure that's what that 15-year-old blondie from Frankfurt thought when he almost took your head off last time we went over. In fact, was it not my shot that kept your big mouth alive, or am I remembering this wrong? More Snickers. Out of the corner of his eye, the corporal could see Brixton's cheeks turn red and a look of annoyance from his ugly square face. Corbo looked back at the tea and smiled. All right, lads, water's nice and hot. Get your cups ready. You know the drill. No cup, no tea. The 
crowd of soldiers huddled around the corporal, slowly changed shape into a cube. Okay, so who's first? Ah, Jenkins. I'd say a little bit of a citrus flavor for you. We know you've certainly got a bubbly personality, eh, boys? Worsley, you ugly bastard. Definitely a black tea for you. <laughs> Kingman, definitely black tea as well. I don't think I've seen you smile once since we met. Make sure to put plenty of bergamot in yours. This continued on for several minutes. The queue in front of the corporal's little hall grew shorter and shorter until finally the last soldier had been served and the corporal could drink his own tea. He sipped the dark liquid, savoring each taste. He paused. The sky had turned blue. The artillery had stopped, and for the first time in a long time, there was peace. What a beautiful place this must have been in the spring, he thought to himself. He could imagine the rolling fields and beautiful expanses of trees that once covered this scarred patch of earth. Suddenly, the corporal heard a sound, one of the more beautiful that exists on this planet the harmonic chirping of a bird. Looking up, the corporal saw a small bird fly overhead, likely a lark, but he wasn't sure. It circled for a few seconds before continuing on its way. The corporal lay down on his muddy blankets, buried his head in his arms, and cried. 